You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This is the Useless Information Podcast. I am Steve Silverman. Useless Information. So I've been to Washington, D.C. several times over the years, and I have to tell you, it offers an incredible assortment of great architecture, monuments, and museums. But what I really like is that most of it has free admission. I mean, you can't beat that. So what I do is I keep a mental list of places I'd like to visit the next time I'm there, and one of those places is the U.S. Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Because let's face it, who doesn't want to be in the place where they print money? It's the place where you can theoretically, you know, smell the money, although free samples are probably out of the question when you're leaving. A survey of records by the Bureau revealed that there had been a total of $2,800 stolen during just 12 thefts in the 30 years prior to 1954. Well, really, that's nothing when compared to the estimated $3.4 trillion worth of securities that were printed during that same time period. In fact, there are so many checks and counterchecks built into the system that it was once thought that it'd be nearly impossible to steal newly printed money in any significant quantity. You know, only a fool would dare to do so, and of course they'd most certainly be caught before they ever exited the premises. Well, that line of thinking would all change on January 4th of 1954. That's when Sewell A. Davis, he was a stockman for the Bureau, well, he was assigned to transfer bricks of currency from a pallet that was in Vault D-19 to another location. So as he lifted two of the bricks, you know, one in each hand, he noticed a discrepancy in one of them. So Davis turned to his co-worker Paul Coakley and stated, quote, One of these bricks feels light. He then handed the brick to Coakley and added, Does it feel light to you? Now, as Coakley gave it a heft, he replied, Yes, it does. Davis then tore off the brick's craft paper wrapping, and he was shocked by what he saw. It was nothing but a stack of blank white paper. So while the two were alerting supervisors to the fake brick, another employee, a guy named Frederick A. Minor, he discovered a second one. Somehow, $8,020 bills, that's a total of $160,000, or over $1.5 million a day, $160,000 had somehow just disappeared from the vault. So, of course, the Secret Service was immediately alerted and an investigation was launched. Now, they still believed it would be impossible to get these large bricks out of the facility. They measured 14 by 6 by 2.5 inches, or 35.6 by 15.2 by 6.4 centimeters, and they weighed in at around 8 pounds or 3.6 kilograms. They just couldn't believe anybody would be able to get these things out of this heavily guarded facility. So a search was begun internally, as you can probably guess, nothing was found. Now the only clue that investigators had were the date stamp seals found on each of the packages. They were confirmed as being authentic and they were dated December 17, 1953 and New Year's Eve, December 31, 1953. This implied that the money had been stolen recently, you know, within days, and also suggested that the thief, or thieves, had intentionally timed it so that the theft took advantage of the three-day New Year's holiday weekend that occurred that year. Believing that the theft could have only been done by a Bureau employee with direct access to the vault, investigators began to question the staff. Unfortunately, they were unable to interview everyone before the shift ended, so they planned to continue the questioning the next morning. Well, they never got that far. At 5 a.m. the next morning, Virginia State Police received a call from 45-year-old Irving Grant. He worked as a butler and chauffeur on a 340-acre farm that was located near Middleburg, Virginia, which is about 40 miles or 64 kilometers west of our nation's capital. Grant informed them that they could find the missing money there. So troopers raced to the scene and Grant led them to a metal toolbox 
which was found to contain 44 bundles of newly printed $20 bills. A total of $88,000 was in that box. Not only that, but there was an additional $7,000 in smaller bills, you know, 1s, 5s, and 10s, and they were believed to have been given as change for bills, you know, for the illegal bills that had been cashed in at various retail establishments. Grant had an interesting story to tell. He said that his daughter, her husband, and another man had driven down from D.C. the night before in a newly purchased Oldsmobile. They said that they had, quote, pulled a smoothie and needed to hide some money on the farm until, quote, it cools off a little. Grant initially refused to cooperate, but quickly changed his mind when one of the men pulled out a gun. And in exchange for his efforts in concealing the money, they gave him a sock filled with $3,000 in cash. After the three left, Grant's conscience got the better of him. He stayed awake all night and decided early the next morning that he needed to notify the police. He later told the press, quote, It was hard to do. She was my daughter. But I knew what the right thing was. The truth is right. The truth is right. He added, I figure my life isn't worth that. I know my life is in danger. I don't need anything. I figure I'm working for an honest man, and he gives me what I need. Later that morning at 10 a.m., the Secret Service agents arrested Grant's son-in-law. He was 29-year-old James Rufus Landis, and they arrested him at his place of employment, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Now, Landis on the surface would seem like an unlikely suspect. He had worked at the Bureau since he was 16 years old. He had received the Purple Heart, Bronze Star Medal, and the Good Conduct Medal for his service in Europe during World War II, and had been twice wounded and granted a medical discharge. At the time of his arrest, Landis was earning $1.42 an hour. That's thirteen sixty nine per hour today. He was earning $1.42 an hour to move newly printed money from the packaging machines to those storage vaults. As you probably expect, Landis initially denied that he removed any cash from the building. He claimed that a man from New York, a Mr. Shapiro, had conceived of the plan to steal the money. But when investigators laid out the evidence before him, Landis finally admitted to pulling the heist. He then led agents to a storage room on the fifth floor of the building, and there they found a paper bag filled with an additional $32,000 that he had hidden under a pallet on the day of the theft. Then at 2 p.m., agents arrested his wife. She was 26-year-old Mamie Landis, and she was arrested at their Addison Chapel apartment in Capitol Heights, Maryland. Now get this. The couple had met when she was 11 years old, and they married three years later. She was 14, and they married when James was home on furlough during World War II. At the time of the couple's arrest, the pair had been married for 12 years, and they were parents to two young boys. Under questioning, Mrs. Landis denied any knowledge of the theft of the money. Open quote. If he did this thing, he did it for the kids and me. She added, Times have been hard. He worried about not being able to give us the things he wanted us to have, the things everybody else had. He wanted the kids to be doctors or lawyers or something like that, like every father does. I will do everything I can to help him. He has always been a wonderful husband. She continued, He always handled the money. He just left enough here for me to buy small things, like bread. I know there was never much left out of his check after the bills were paid. Once in a while, he would come home with some extra money. He said he got lucky gambling. I always figured that if there were anything he wanted me to know, he would tell me. I'm not a prying wife. Now, her husband James told the press, quote, I really messed things up. I got my wife involved. For the crime, both faced up to 10 years imprisonment and a possible $10,000 fine. A judge set bail for James at $50,000, 
and his wife's was set at $10,000. That's about $480,000 in total today. Of course, there was still one man who was still unaccounted for. That's the person who accompanied the couple out to the farm the previous evening. He was identified as 27-year-old William Giles, and he was a government flagpole painter. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Anyway, William Giles was a government flagpole painter, and he had told his wife that he made the money gambling. They arrested him in his apartment, which just happened to be in the same building that the Landises lived in. He readily admitted his involvement. Quote, I did it for the future of my family. I can't give them all the things that I want to give them. The next day, January 6th, two additional suspects were arrested. They just happened to be two of James Landis's cousins. They were 27-year-old Charles Howard Nelson and 24-year-old Edith Irene Chase. Police revealed that they were also on the hunt for 29-year-old Roger Patterson. He had been seen flashing bills at a card game on New Year's Eve, and a witness told detectives that Patterson had, quote, a stack of bills about six inches high under the back seat of his car. Their search ended when Patterson came stumbling into the 12th Precinct Station on January 9th. He said, quote, Somebody's looking for me, and I'm giving myself up. Unfortunately, he was too intoxicated to be questioned at the time, but later told detectives that he knew of Landis' plan to rob the Bureau 30 days before it occurred. So I guess the big question is, how did he do it? First, Landis paid careful attention to every detail involved in the packaging and storage of the money. As the money was stacked into the packaging machines, a wooden block would be placed at either end to prevent damage. Then the stack of money would be compressed and wire bands would be wrapped around to secure the bundle. Finally, the brick would be wrapped in craft paper and then labeled and dated before being stacked onto a pallet. But what really caught Landis' attention in this whole process was how lax workers and inspectors were when it came to disposing of unbroken wire bands, the extra wooden end blocks, and the craft paper that had the treasury seals on them. So he began to collect these things up, and he took them home in his pockets. It was while his wife was busy taking care of the children each evening that Landis would attempt to duplicate the bricks of money. It took him close to three months but he was able to come up with a dummy brick that would pass for the real thing. The only thing he lacked was a machine capable of pressing the paper tightly together. That's the reason why his dummies were lighter than the real thing. He simply couldn't squeeze the same number of sheets of paper into his stacks. Surprisingly, this detail was of little concern to him, and that's because he knew if he could successfully replace a couple of the bricks on a pallet, It could be months before the theft was discovered. And that's because the pallets were typically stored in a bureau vault for a couple of months before being shipped off to any of the 12 Federal Reserve banks around the country. Once there, the money could sit untouched for several more months before being distributed to banks. By then, he figured it'd be difficult to determine by whom or where in the distribution system the bricks had been stolen. So it was shortly before 7.30 a.m. on December 31st that Landis entered the bureau with two of his fake bricks wrapped in a package. It was standard practice not to search anyone with packages coming into the facility, but those who did were supposed to check them at the receiving desk. So a guard directed Landis to the desk, but as soon as Landis felt that the guard's attention had been diverted, he quickly changed course and headed down the hall with the package in hand. Landis proceeded to take an elevator to the third floor, and he hid the dummy bricks under a burlap bag which lined a trash can in locker room number 327. From there, Landis headed to his normal locker room, that's D101 on the first floor, and he changed into his work clothes. At 7.30 a.m., he reported for duty at his scheduled time. 
His job was to place an enormous stack of bills onto a platform so they could be sent through the wrapping machine. He knew from previous experience that it would be 20 minutes before he'd need to refill the platform. That was 20 minutes to pull off the next step in his plan. At 7.50, he walked over one of the pallets and he casually removed two of the bricks. He then walked over to a roll of craft paper and tore off enough to conceal the two bricks of currency. His destination was a pre-chosen storage room on the fifth floor of the D-Wing. But the only way for him to get there from his current first floor location in the A-Wing was to use a passageway that connected all of the wings in the basement of the facility. And that's exactly what he did. Upon arrival in the storage room, he quickly removed the paper packaging from each of the bricks. He was careful not to damage the two ends that carried the official treasury labels and the date stamps. He then carefully folded the labels and he placed them in his pocket. After breaking the metal bands with a pair of pliers, he placed the bulk of the money into a paper bag. Now 32,000 of it didn't fit into the first bag, so he placed it into a second. He then hid both bags under a pallet in that storage room. Landis then promptly returned to his assigned duty, and no one suspected anything out of the ordinary. Then, at 10.40, it was time for a scheduled rest break. So Landis rushed to the locker room where he had hidden those two dummy packages under that burlap bag. He then pulled out the packaging labels he had stuffed in his pocket. He soaked them under hot water in the sink, and he removed the treasury labels from the paper. To dry them, he placed the labels between the fins of the radiator in the restroom. Then, once dry, he pulled the two dummy packages out of the garbage can, and he affixed the labels to the brick ends using glue that he had concealed in his pocket. They now looked exactly like the real thing. As the end of his break approached, he walked right back to his station, and while he was doing that, he placed the dummy bricks onto the pallet, and he continued on with his normal work until the end of the day. When his workday ended at 3.10 p.m., Landis went to the locker room and he changed into his street clothes. From there, he took a detour to that fifth-floor storage room and he grabbed his fortune. Now, he realized he'd be unable to get two bags filled with money past the guards, so he decided to leave the smaller amount behind. You know, the one that he would later lead investigators to after being caught. Getting the money through security was easier than anyone could have ever imagined. You see, since it was the holiday season and many of the workers had been exchanging gifts, security was somewhat more relaxed than usual. And since it was common for workers to take laundry home to wash, he simply placed a pair of trousers in the bag and that concealed his stolen loot below. Then, as he passed through security, Landis just pulled one leg of the trousers out of the bag, you know, to show that it contained dirty clothing, and the guard just let him pass through. And with that final move, James Rufus Landis had just stolen $128,000 from the United States Bureau of Engraving and Printing. While Landis had pulled this all off by himself, he knew that at best he had six months before the Bureau realized that the money was gone. And since the bills all had consecutive serial numbers, he knew that they'd be easy to trace. Landis concluded that he needed to get rid of the money as quickly as possible. Well, his plan was really straightforward. He would make a small purchase with one of the $20 bills, and of course the change would be in legitimate money. Now this is simpler said than done, and that's because a $20 bill had a lot of buying power in 1954, it's worth nearly $200 today. You know, a lot of stores just can't give change to that kind of money. And if the same person just kept walking in, you know, day after day, you know, trying to do so, you know, someone was sure to take notice. His solution was to have others assist him in spending the money. And that's where the others who were arrested, excluding his wife, come in. They would drive around the region, stop in every liquor store that they pass, and they'd purchase a bottle of spirits. Any changes they received from these purchases were turned over to Landis, who planned on splitting the profits at a later date. 
for the next few days they were living the high life. In addition to purchasing three automobiles, Landis's cousin Charles Nelson was observed lighting a cigar with a burning $20 bill. Everything seemed great until a holiday weekend ended and everyone, including Landis, returned to work on Monday, January 4th. Of course, that's the day that the money was discovered missing. It was later that day that Landis made the decision to drive out with his neighbor William Giles to his father-in-law's place, you know, in an effort to hide the money. They probably never imagined that Irving Grant would have a guilty conscience and turn his own daughter in for the crime. On February 15th, a grand jury charged James Landis with theft of money. His four accomplices received a lesser charge of, quote, feloniously and unlawfully receiving and passing the stolen money. All the charges against Mrs. Landis were dropped. While awaiting trial, Landis, Charles Nelson, and two other men were caught passing even more of the stolen money. Apparently, they never heard about lying low. Anyway, this resulted in both Landis and Nelson receiving stiffer sentences than it was initially thought that they would receive. On May 28, 1954, Landis was sentenced to three to nine years in prison and fined $10,000. Federal Judge David A. Pine said he took into consideration the fact that Landis had been cooperative with the Secret Service. He added that if Landis was able to produce the money that was still missing, an estimated $15,680, he would consider dropping the fine. As for the others, Charles Nelson was sentenced to two to eight years in prison with a $3,000 fine. Roger Patterson got 20 months to five years, and Edith Chase received a suspended sentence of one to three years. Now, there would be a larger theft at the Bureau in 1989 by Robert P. Schmidt, who was in charge of the Threaded Currency Paper Project. He took advantage of his position and was able to smuggle out $1.6 million in $100 bills that he had concealed in a zippered compartment in his briefcase. That may be more money, but it doesn't come close to the creativity and ingenuity that Landis used to pull off his daring theft in 1954. Useless? Useful? I'll leave that for you to decide. It's one of my favorite commercials from when I was a kid. I remember singing it all the time. Well, the development of kennel racing can be traced directly back to World War I. That's because motorized vehicles were slow to be introduced to the battlefield, you know, so horses were the dominant mode of ground transportation at the time. One man who was able to secure a government contract to supply horses for the war effort was a farmer named Philip Chappelle, who operated a small farm near Batavia, New York. By the time the Great War had ended, he had supplied the United States with an estimated 117,000 horses. When the war ended, Chappelle faced a difficult problem. You see, with a sudden surge in motorized vehicle use, demand for his horses plunged. In search of a new market, Philip, along with his brother Ernest, they came up with the idea of selling pickled horse meat. While certainly not a product that Americans would eat, they did find success shipping the product overseas to countries that did consume horse meat. But they were still in search of a better selling product, and they came up with the idea of canning their horse meat and selling it as dog food. In 1923, the Chappelle brothers moved their operation to Rockford, Illinois, and began the production of kennel ration canned dog food. Today, the thought of feeding horse meat to your dog would be unheard of, but back then, the idea of feeding a dog a healthy, well-balanced meal, well, that proved to be quite popular. From 1923 through 1933, they produced 57,889,564 cans of kennel ration dog food. 
As awful as it sounds today, the Chappelle brothers were slaughtering an estimated 50,000 horses per year in the 1930s. It would be the Great Depression that would bring the Chappelle brothers to the brink of bankruptcy. You see, with consumers eating less and less beef, the butchers needed to find a new market for their product. And you know what they chose. Dog food. Now, the Chappelle brothers did attempt to introduce a beef-based dog food, you know, a beef-based kennel ration. But overall, their sales just plummeted. Philip Chappelle was eventually ejected from the company that he founded, and it was then sold to Quaker Oats in 1942. Which leads us to that famous kennel ration jingle that you just heard. In the 1960s, Quaker Oats turned to the Dick Marks and Associates firm, and they asked them to come up with a new advertising jingle. Marks, who was an accomplished jazz pianist and arranger, well, he created some of the most memorable jingles ever. Double your pleasure, double your fun. You know, Wrigley's Double Mint Gum. There's two scoops of raisins in every package of Kellogg's Raisin Bran. And aren't you glad that you used Dial? Marx found the jingle that he was looking for in a song titled My Dog's Bigger Than Your Dog, which was a real song written by Tom Paxton. Of course, Marx tweaked it so the commercial consisted of children singing the song and, of course, promoting kennel ration. A little bit of trivia is that one of the children that can be heard singing in that commercial, now I'm not sure if it's this particular commercial, but one of those early commercials, was Dick Marx's son. That was 80s singer-songwriter Richard Marx. So here's a question for you. Today it seems like there's an ATM machine just about everywhere. It's estimated there are approximately 3 million machines in operation worldwide, although really no one can say for sure what the exact number is. Yet, as with all technologies, it had to start somewhere. Do you know in what year the first ATM machine, I mean one that uses a card with a magnetic stripe, what year was the first ATM machine introduced? Now, I know this is a bit obscure, so if you can get within, say, three years of the real answer, the teacher in me will give you full credit for getting it right. Well, hang around for a bit, and I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. In other news, here are three stories from decades ago. 39-year-old Russell B. Hayward became despondent as his excessive drug use took control of his life. So in July 12, 1924, as hundreds of people were standing on a seawall or strolling through New York's Battery Park, he decided to end it all and he took a flying leap into the bay below. But as hard as Hayward tried, he was unable to sink below the surface. And that's because he had forgotten to remove his artificial leg, which was made of cork. Brooklyn resident James Weber, who operated a stand that rented binoculars on the shore, well, he spotted the leg bobbing up and down in the water. So without hesitation, Weber just jumped into the water fully clothed, and he swam out to Hayward in an effort to save his life. But it wouldn't be easy. Hayward kept poking Weber with his cork leg in an effort to keep him away. But Weber refused to give up, and he eventually was able to grab hold of Hayward. After grabbing onto a line tossed from an excursion boat, the two were drawn into safety. Police then escorted Hayward to Bellevue Hospital for care. In our next story, Franz Althoff, the director of the Althoff Circus in Germany, he came up with what he thought would be the perfect publicity stunt. On July 21, 1950, he intended to lead a four-year-old elephant into one of the cars of the Wuppertal Schwieberbahn, which is an inverted monorail. The 450-pound or 204-kilogram elephant was so upset by the motion of the car that she became agitated and began to move around wildly. Suddenly, she broke through one of the windows and she fell an estimated 39 feet or 12 meters into the Wuppertal River below. Amazingly, the elephant, who was quickly named Tufi, which is the Italian word for diving, she suffered only minor injuries. Several of the car's human occupants were also bruised in the ruckus. Tuffy would later be sold to the Cirque Alexis Grus in 1968, and she died there in 1989 at 43 years of age. And in our last story for today, one would expect many things to be left behind by riders on New York City subways. 
You know, cell phones, umbrellas, coats, and similar items. So imagine the surprise of transit workers when they found a life-size statue of St. Anthony holding the Christ child in his arms, abandoned on the mezzanine level of the East Broadway station of the IND 6th Avenue line on Christmas Eve of 1963. There the brown plaster statue sat in its crate, standing 6 feet or 1.83 meters tall and weighing in a whopping 250 pounds or 113.4 kilograms. And of course, with no one there to claim it, the statue was hauled off to the Transit Authority's Lost and Found Department at 370 J Street. Two days later, a Haitian man named Etienne Agnan walked in to claim the statue. Agnan, who had moved to New York City four months prior, explained he had done some statue work for St. Teresa's Church on the corner of Rutgers and Henry Streets. For his efforts, church officials rewarded Agnan with the statue of St. Anthony. He planned to take it to Upper Manhattan for some repair work before he shipped it off to Haiti. So Agnan lugged the massive statue into the subway, but soon realized there was absolutely no way he could easily get this thing onto the train. So he opted to leave the statue on the mezzanine level while he ran upstairs to seek outside transportation. By the time he returned, subway workers had already hauled the statue off to the lost and found. Personally, I think I would have opted for a U-Haul instead. <laughs> so earlier in the podcast, I'd asked you when the first ATM machine was used. Technically, a Scottish inventor named John Shepherd Barron was the first to come up with the idea of a machine that could dispense cash. Supposedly, he came up with the idea while he was taking a bath. When his first machine was installed at a Barclays Bank branch in northern London in June 1967, it had a very unusual feature. It used paper vouchers that had been printed with radioactive carbon-14 ink. When the customer inserted the voucher into the machine, the beta emissions would be detected, and if they matched up with the PIN code that the customer had entered, cash would be dispensed. But the true refinement of the machine into what we know today, you know, where you stick in a magnetically striped card and you get some cash out, that credit goes to a man named Donald Wetzel, who was vice president for a Dallas company called Docutel in the 1960s. The story goes that he was in need of some quick cash for a business trip that he was leaving on. And the problem was when he got to the bank, it was a Friday. Everyone had just been paid and there were long lines of people, you know, either depositing their checks or withdrawing cash. As he patiently waited his turn to talk to a teller, he wondered if it would be possible for a machine to do the same thing. So he approaches engineers with the idea of designing an automated teller and they set to work on the challenge. Docutel's first machine was installed at a chemical bank branch in Rockville, Long Island. Called the Docuteller, the public gained access to it on September 2, 1969. This was the first fully automated machine that used a card with a magnetic stripe on it. What's most interesting is that these early machines were not online. The machine had no way of knowing how much money was in an account, so one was limited to a $150 daily withdrawal limit. Basically, it was the honor system. Also, this first machine could only dispense cash. It wouldn't be until 1971 when the company introduced the total teller that one could make deposits or transfer money between accounts. Personally, my first use of an ATM machine wouldn't be until 1981. I was going to college in Buffalo, New York, which was a long distance from my parents' home, so when they needed to send me money, they would go to their local Marine Midland Bank branch and make a deposit. I could then withdraw the cash from a Marine Midland Moneymatic machine, which was located in the campus student union. Well, that brings another episode of the Useless Information Podcast to a close. Just an update on the progress of my next book, The Flip Side of History. The manuscript has been completed, and I'm just awaiting word back from the editor with her suggestions and corrections. The biggest problem that I see is that I plan for 40,000 words in total, but I wrote close to 65,000. So I'm not sure if she's going to knock out some of the stories or try to just, you know, simply shorten them in length. 
I should know shortly since the final manuscript is due to the printer in less than a month. I did notice that the book is listed on Amazon for a mid-July release, but there's really little other information there except for the ability to pre-order the book. Be sure to sign up for my Twitter feed. It's at UselessInfoCast, and you'll be among the first to know when a new episode is released. Again, the handle is at UselessInfoCast. Also be sure to like the show on Facebook. Just do a quick search for the Useless Information podcast there and it should show up. My website, which has transcripts of the podcast along with images for this story and many others, it's located at uselessinformation.org. If you'd like to contact me for any reason, you can do so at steve at uselessinformation.org. That's steve at uselessinformation.org. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Anyway, thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in next time. Bye.